Um, some of you have not been here for the previous two sessions. So for that purpose, let me give you a brief summary of what I did in the first and second sessions so that we'll all be in the same position. First session, we talked about uh, Jesus and what we know of Jesus as what he lived. And there's not much. Uh, we know that he lived. We know that he preached. We know he was crucified. Uh, that's all we know. Uh, what else we might know comes indirectly from the Gospels, uh, some of which historically true, some of which maybe not, we don't know, but one is, first of all, he was a very charismatic person. One does not do what he did without being in that, that, that magnetic personality. Second of all, his message seems to be quite consistent with what we read in the Old Testament about social justice, about the opposite of kings to their subjects, uh, to the covenant with the Jews. All of these were part of his preaching, uh, and, and as a result, that had a tremendous impact. It was the right message, because people knew about the Old Testament and many of its learnings. So he was saying the same things that they understood to be true from their understanding of the Old Testament. Uh, thirdly, uh, he was crucified, and uh, we we think he, he went to heaven, but we don't know, absolutely, but it seems to be a story that made a great deal of sense whether it happened or not. It doesn't matter so much as that believe, people believe it to be true, and we believe it to be true. So those things elevated him to a unique position of authority and, and, and uh, responsibility among all the other preachers, and there were many of them at the time. So that, that was what we did in the first session. The second session, we focused in on the Gospels. Now, the Gospels were written anywhere from 40 to 80 years after the death of Jesus. So they were a result of oral tradition, which is to say people repeating stories to others. The accuracy of that process may be in question, the complete accuracy, but nonetheless, there's some consistency enough from gospel to gospel to believe that there was some, some truth to that. Uh, so we rely on the gospels for a view of Jesus. We rely on the Gospels for having some truth to the experience. Other than that, however, every Gospel was written for a particular purpose at a particular time for a particular audience. And we talked about how all those Gospels did that. That's not to say that they had no validity. They did. But as an example, in Matthew, he was very much focused on uh, Jesus' uh, lineage with all of the figures in the Old Testament. If you read the first chapter in Matthew, it walks you through how, how many names? We don't know, hundreds of names, but they were all, the, the idea was to identify Jesus with the historical past written in the Old Testament. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are accounts in, in uh, John that depict Jesus not so much as an historical figure, but as a divine figure. And that that view of Jesus was, we'll talk about it today, replicated over time in different accounts to the point where some believe that Jesus was always divine. Never a real historical figure, always divine. We'll talk more about that when we get into the various Gospels. So that's what we did last time. This time, we're going to talk about the church as it became formulated. I, I should tell you, uh, the Gospels were written probably maybe a thousand people. There might have been a thousand people or fewer that were in a position to understand and read the Gospels. Uh, that number expanded to the point where it started becoming what we recognize as a church, as opposed to a simple Jesus movement, which is what it was at the time of the Gospels. So we're going to talk about the history here of the church as it comes into being, as it begins to mature, 
And mm -hmm. that's a story over this and the next three sessions is how the church has matured, including our own, by the way. We are different Presbyterians than we were 300 years ago. Very different. And we'll talk more about it. We shouldn't feel guilty about that. Don't, don't get me wrong. But it is different. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Did I do something? There we go. Okay, here's the summary. So, um, during the 300 years of... Uh, how do I get rid of this? During the 300 years between uh, the Gospel of John and the reign of Constantine, uh, the church became a identifiable religion, uh, in beginning to include elements of pagan. Talk more about that through slides. And becoming separate from Judaism. And during the Gospels, of course, uh, Christianity wasn't Christianity as such. There's no mention of Christianity in any, any of the Gospels. It was a form of Judaism. It was a variant of Judaism. And, and recognized as such, both by Jews on the one hand and Rome on the other. Uh, I suppose on Zoom to mute themselves. Why am I not getting this? Okay. Uh, during this time, following John, a number of gospels some of which are included in the New Testament, many of which are not. And you would recognize them as Christian Gospels. We'll talk more about that in a few slides. But there was a bunch of opinions out there about what it meant to be a Christian and what it meant to follow Jesus. Um, um, finally, under Constantine, uh, Christianity, after years of being pursued as, as a heresy, um, was accepted as the religion of the Lord. Uh, it wasn't accepted everywhere. It took a while for Christianity to become adopted over time. We'll talk more about that uh, today and next week. But nonetheless, it was religion of the land under Constantine. Uh, as this occurred, the Eastern and Western Roman empires began to settle. <clears throat> And the Eastern Roman Empire became dominant, which is to say it was wealthier, it was stronger, was more militarily sound. In the West, it began to decline. It took a long time for the Gothic tribes to take over Rome. But nonetheless, that weakening occurred in large part because it was very expensive to maintain the military. Uh, it was a huge geography to try to maintain, and they couldn't do it. It just didn't have the wealth to do that. Um, uh, I mentioned this. The fall of Roman Empire took a, a long time. It didn't happen immediately. And um, uh, it also occurred about the same time as St. Augustine. All heard of St. Augustine? Mm -hmm. Well, he was a significant addition to Christian theology that we see even today, and I want to talk more about Augustine when we get there, because it's important we understand what he was saying and how it affects, say, Presbyterians. Because the idea of predestination uh, derived not from John Calvin, but from St. Augustine. His original idea was, began there and began incorporated both in the Catholic Church and, yes, the Presbyterian Church our beloved church of today. Okay? I'm not trying to be snide. Please don't. <laughs> don't think that. Okay, well, here's that. This is the Roman Empire. It was huge. At its height, it completely surrounded the Mediterranean Sea. One of, one of the important elements that we all often don't recognize is the extent to which northern Africa, which at the time was fertile, 
and generated lots and lots of grain, and they sent the grain to Rome. Uh, and one of the ways Rome was able to maintain its wealth and its position was access to the rich agriculture of Northern Africa. Once that began to break down, and it did, then Rome became less and less powerful over time. Um, here are some characteristics of the Roman Empire. I'll, I'll walk through them very quickly. Uh, urban culture. It's important that we understand that the model for Christian organization was based in cities. That's where bishops were based. That's where their effort to expand the breadth of Christianity was centered, and it was built on the Roman model. That's the way Roma, Rome operated, was out of cities. Um, the, uh, there was local administration. Uh, Rome relied on proxies, on client chains. Uh, that, that was true of Palestine. Uh, they would find some local leader who was very compliant and ready to administer the area as much as Rome wanted to. And that was cheap for them, and it worked out just fine. That local control helped them expand their influence relatively cheaply. Um, but every city looked the same. If you went to, to, say, Cairo, it had the same layout as Rome. So there was some consistency from city to city. And that consistency, by the way, helped the expansion of Christianity. Um, we'll talk more about this. But really, there was, there was no separation between church and state. The church and the state were one. And that had implications for uh, what you did in terms of worship. It had implications for what you did in terms of loyalty to the state. And it also separated Christians, on one hand, from those who believed in religion and state on the other. It's one of the things that identified Christians as suspicious. Um, the elite was, in, in part, part of the government. They would have, you know, the, the Colosseum and, and the great events at Colosseum, those were privately financed. That was not a government operation. And there was a lot of public works, a lot of public celebrations that were funded by the elite. The elite was very wealthy, and they could afford to do that. But it had added a, an element to Roman culture, which began to break down as the wealth of the Roman Empire began to decline. The elite no longer formed that role, and it began to topple downward over time. And Latin was the common language. Latin, by the way, was the common language of the church and continues to be used in some worship ceremonies, Latin, you, you can go to some Catholic services today and, and hear the, the Mass in Latin. Um, this, is an, this is a good slide. It, it talks a little bit about paganism. We think of paganism as, as this evil thing. Well, fact is that it was a part of culture. It was what people believed in. To some extent, there were elements of paganism which are similar to what we understand in Christianity, and Christianity incorporated some of the same practices in paganism that we see today. Uh, how am I going to do this? But at the end of the first century, Christianity was still the religion of a few. The Roman Empire was overwhelmingly pagan and it seemed impossible to imagine that the teachings of an obscure sect could challenge its influence. Religion in the ancient world is very much a part of public life. They had no idea of a separation of religion and state. Paganism is the rich native religious stew of a traditional society in the Mediterranean. It's a spiritual universe that's thickly populated with gods and spirits. When you look up into the stars at night, you see the souls of heroes. Paganism was very tolerant of other religions. The Olympian gods were revered, but this did not prevent their devotees worshiping other gods. 
You have low-tech religions like magic. People routinely go to magicians. If you, if you have a sinus infection, if you need somebody to fall in love with you, if you're betting on a horse and you've lost the past three races, you go to a professional. At the same time, more and more people were seeking solace in more spiritual and personal forms of religion. A fresco in Pompeii shows worshippers celebrating the solemn rites of the ancient Dionysian mystery cult. And newer cults, often from foreign parts, were taking hold around the empire. Greatest of the gods, first of names, thou rulest over the midair and the immeasurable space. Thou art the lady of light. One would have found in the major um, cities of the Mediterranean basin uh, a cult of the Egyptian gods. Egyptian cults would have included probably Isis as the ascendant deity. Isis was perceived by her devotees as being remarkably attentive. Isis would respond to you when you were in trouble. She would answer your prayers. She had that reputation. One of the most important uh, representations of Isis is what we call the Isis lactans. That's Isis suckling uh, her offspring at her breast. This is a kind of iconography that appears to have been terribly determinative in the early iconography of Mary and Jesus. Worshippers of the age-old Persian god Mithras gathered in secret chapels throughout the empire. They would eat sacred meals together and celebrate their God's birthday on December 25th. So a couple things here. First of all, uh, the idea, the Christian idea and the Jewish idea of one God, mind-blowing for the pagans, pagans because there were many gods. Some had greater importance than others, but nonetheless, one God, what is this one God idea? The second thing has to do with Christ's message that leave to Caesars what is Caesars and leave to gods what is gods. What? There is no difference between God and Caesar. They're all the same part of the same thing. So these ideas sort of struck people as not just odd, but somewhat subversive. So uh, uh, very different from, from the Christian message was very different from what uh, people understood from paganism, uh, which, uh, which you'd think would be benign, but no, it was considered to be a threat to the empire. And we'll talk more about that in a few slides. Um, it was still a small part of the Roman Empire, even following uh, the Gospels. Um, the, the total number of Christians, even at the, at the reign of Constantine, when he had identified Christianity as the state religion, no more than 10% of the population could be considered Christian. It was not a majority or a dominant religion. It happened to be a state religion, but not a dominant religion. So it's important we understand the context for how Christianity was perceived and developed over time. Um, here are some elements of, of, of pagan influences. <clears throat> we already talked a little bit about Sunday worship. Uh, not a Christian idea. Well, consider uh, Judaism, worship on Saturday. Why Sunday? Because it happened to, to fit the Julian calendar, which is part of the Roman calendar. Um, deification of Mary, Mary. Mary was never deified in the, in, in, the, uh, in the Gospels. She became so. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying it was an influence that was not a part of the original Gospel message. Uh, birth date of Jesus, December 25th. What? Never happened. It's it's convenient. I'm really glad it's December 25th. It's a great time. Love to come to church. Love to open presents. It's not a Christian idea. Sorry to tell you. Um, the organizational structure of bishops as Roman prefects, very much. We talked a little bit about the organization of Rome. <clears throat> one of the things that, one of the reasons why Constantine liked the idea of Christianity, because there were bishops in all these cities, and suddenly they had client rulers similar to what 
they saw in Palestine with Herod. So, neat idea. Constantine was a politician as much as he was a religious thinker. Um, and the role of saints as proxies for pagan gods, this became an extremely important part of the medieval culture and worship of Christianity. More in that next week. Okay. How are we doing here? Questions? I see a lot of head nods. You're either uh, paying attention or falling asleep. I don't know. Yes, sir. A question. Um, could it be the church compromised? Uh, to overcome cultural barriers, but it wasn't necessarily necessarily a bad thing. No, uh, look, uh, how we practice our religion today has as much to do with culture as it does with religious doctrine. It's not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, it helps us be more comfortable with how we worship and uh, and uh, how we practice our faith is to make sure we integrate it, as long as there's no jarring dissonance, uh, mm -hmm. as much as we integrate it with current culture. So we, we do that all the time. It's the way we it's, it's the way we worship our faith now. So I, I'm not bothered by it. I hope you're not either. Um, okay, so this has to do with uh, uh, <coughs> Christianity's threat to the empire. Look, let's talk more about this. Because it was considered a part of Judaism, Christianity was considered to be protected by the legal status of Jewish tradition within the Roman Empire. So when we see Pliny taking note of Christians as a separate group, it really marks a departure, a change in the status of Christianity, both in its relationship to Judaism and in its relationship to the Roman Empire. Christians are warred upon by the Jews and are persecuted by the Greeks, and those that hate them cannot state the cause of their enmity. Pliny's program evolved into a very explicit um, policy of execution that probably was the model throughout a good deal of Asia Minor, when what's now modern Turkey. And that policy was to, to ask the question, uh, if the answer is no, fine, go sacrifice. If they couldn't sacrifice, then that was proof that they were Christian and they could be executed. So uh, Pliny thought ultimately that once the, the, the matter was settled that he was doing the right thing, that he was saving the empire from the spread of a, of a dangerous and seditious uh, movement. It was precisely their unwillingness to make public sacrifice to the emperor and the gods that made Christians seem antisocial and seditious. Religion was one of the most important features of the maintenance of the state. One offered sacrifices on certain days as a part of the celebration of the, the, the founding of the state. One offered sacrifices on the birthday of the emperor. Cities very often mounted these enormous celebrations to celebrate the emperors, and all the populace would have been expected to come and join in. At these great public ceremonials, Christians were becoming all too often conspicuous by their absence. When the Christians really do become much more prominent in the social arena of Greek and Roman cities, the pagans start to take note of their absence from important festival days and their unwillingness to participate in certain uh, aspects of social life. Judaism had long ago um, come to a legal agreement with the emperor that they would, Jews would not be forced to participate in pagan rituals. And pagan rituals are part of the normal fabric of life in a Roman city. Jews were exempted from this because Romans knew that Jews were odd about this kind of thing. Now along come this new group, the Christians, and they're behaving the same way, but they obviously aren't ancient. They started under Pontius Pilate, they say so themselves. So it's novel. But if it's novel, from the Roman point of view, it cannot be a religion. Religion is by definition ancient from the Roman perspective. 
So if it's new and novel, it's a, it's a superstition. It's not a religion. And superstition is, by definition, not a good thing. So as Christianity became more and more separate from Judaism, questions were arose around their loyalty. Uh, they could depend on Jews to be loyal because they've, they've been loyal for hundreds and hundreds of years, but what about these Christians? Uh, it's interesting to compare this to how we view people who say, uh, don't salute the flag, or burn the flag, or some other forms of anti-patriotism. Now, we have laws in this country that permit that, but I think all of us think culturally that somebody who doesn't believe in the United States and doesn't support its principles is a su suspicious character. So there's some of that element of, uh, of criticism that we see in pagan Rome. I just want to make sure you understand this, this is this is sort of us. Uh, this is what people do and think. And just because it was so different then doesn't mean that we are different now in some of these more important psychological aspects. Yes, sir. Constantine, 303. Yes. Did that did that change the view of the threat of Christianity? Yes, yes. And we'll talk more about that yeah. if I have time to make sure that, that I, I get there. Um, so I'll just throw all these things up. So the early Christian church was extremely diverse in their opinions about what it meant to be a Christian. So, for instance, opinions on Jesus. Who is Jesus? Was he a real person? Did he really die a uh, death that any other person would die from? Was he divine? Was he always divine? Did he become divine at, 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 at uh, his crucifixion or, or, or what? And there were a number of Gospels that had a different view of this. Um, who was God? Was he a God of judgment? Was he a God of love? Was he, like Paul, was he somebody with whom you could have some kind of a personal relationship? Um, salvation. Okay, if you are saved, what does that mean? Does that mean that you are elevated into heaven, sitting on the right hand of God, or what? And how are you saved? If, in fact, there is such a thing as salvation. All these things had different views, and they appear, by the way, in different forms of Christianity over time. And we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. And then finally, who leads the church? There were people in, in Christianity, early Christians, who believed that only the people who were saved, who were perfect, could lead the church. Now, Augustine had a different view uh, fortunately, for the Catholic Church, you didn't have to be perfect as long as you, you, if you were named bishop, you were bishop. It didn't make any difference whether you were perfect or not, you were heading the church. So there's a, all these opinions appear in the various Gospels. Uh, okay, I'm okay here. Uh, so this video will talk more about how all these, these different opinions we have, in effect, different God. brands of Christianity living often side by side, even in the same city. At one point in Rome, Justin Martyr has his Christian school in one part of the city, and the Gnostic teacher Valentinus in another school in Rome, and another uh, so-called heretic by the name of Marcion is also in Rome just down the street somewhere. All of these alongside of the official uh, uh, papal tradition that developed as part of St. Peter's See in Rome. There were still debates about how Christians should relate to Judaism. One group following the Jewish calendar felt that Easter should fall on the same day as Passover. <coughs> Others thought they should follow the Roman calendar and celebrate during the solar festival of the spring equinox on a Sunday. And Marcion wanted to strip away everything that smacked of Jewish traditions. Marcion was the wealthy ship owner. He came to Rome and he gave the Roman church a lot of money and they welcomed him with open arms. 
but he felt that the original Christian gospel was no longer preserved. Uh, and he thought that only the Apostle Paul had the true gospel. And he set out to find this true gospel, and he took the gospel of Luke and purified it from whatever he thought was Jewish and said, this should be the scripture for the church. And this should be the only scripture for the church. And the Roman church became very suspicious of his manipulations with the gospel of Luke. Uh, it is reported that they gave the money back to him and said, thank you very much, but uh, we don't want you and your gospel. This is where we start to see a kind of proliferation of gospels tradition all over the empire. And by the, the third and early fourth century, there are more gospels than you can actually count, and certainly more than you can easily read within a Bible. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene, for example, shows us uh, a Christian community in which Mary Magdalene is regarded as a disciple, as a leader, as one of the major teachers in the group, and one who claims that women should be able to teach. Another text called the Gospel of Truth uh, is not a narrative of uh, the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus at all. Uh, it's a symbolic reflection on certain uh, themes that come from Scripture and are associated with the life and teachings of Jesus. We also hear of other kinds of Gospels that develop stories of the birth that tell you the, in, in, in lurid detail really how true it really was or how marvelous and miraculous it was. Uh, stories of traveling apostles to uh, all kinds of strange lands. Thomas who goes to India, uh, Andrew who goes out to some strange world and so on. These kinds of stories proliferate through the second and third century. One of the important discoveries at Nag Hammadi was a complete copy of the Gospel of Thomas. Written in Syria in the second century, this collection of sayings proved very influential and startling. The Gospel of Thomas is nothing but sayings of Jesus. It simply goes along and says, Jesus said this, Jesus said that. Uh, well, some of these things that Jesus said according to the Gospel of Thomas are quite familiar. They're very similar to things in the canonical Gospels, but not identical. Give to we have, in effect, different brands of Christianity living off... Sorry, I'm going to cut this off in, in, in the interest of time. But let me tell you that there are all these Gospels, and the question becomes, well, what do we really believe? And there was a bishop in France, Irenaeus, uh, who decided almost single-handedly, but he was very influential, that says, look, we have to decide on what is scripture here. We have to pick some gospels. And they chose the four gospels we know of today. Uh, we think of these gospels, by the way, as sort of the same thing. Well, they're not. And one of the things we talked about last week was how different they are from one another. And the reason for that was uh, intention, which is to say, we want a range of opinion. These gospels represent that range of opinion, but they're not, they're, they're not going crazy. They're not they're Mary Magdalene, they're not Thomas. These are the ones. So there was a very important part of identifying some scriptural and some dogmatic consistency in theory, which by the way, one of the things that Constantine did was to insist on even greater consistency. So uh, we'll, when we get to that slide, we'll talk more about it. Any, any questions on this? Okay. Um, so the Roman Empire was be, be, becoming under stress. Uh, in the, if you notice on the east, uh, what, what is now Turkey and the, Balk, and the Black Sea, they had access to the east. They had waterways, they had ways of promoting commerce that the West did not. They were also defendable. There were waterways and there were mountains that they could use to defend. It was nothing like that in Rome. So for those two big reasons, the East began to separate from the West. Uh, ah, and so here's Constantine. I'll just walk through all the bullets. Um, so Constantine, there, there was a, a battle 
Um, the East and the West had their own emperors, which was fine, except, of course, one emperor didn't want another emperor, he emperor hanging around, so there was constantly friction and battle between the two. Constantine won a battle that identified him as the emperor of the entire Roman Empire. Uh, legend has it that he had a dream, and in that dream, a uh, cross was a part of this, and cross was identified with Christianity, and therefore he felt that his victory was, to some extent, a function of godly intervention, Christian intervention. I don't know about that. But the fact is that Constantine had some belief in Christian uh, thinking. He also saw Christianity as a very uh, convenient way to structure this empire that he suddenly found himself responsible for. So, uh, and the, every major city had a bishop. And the bishops were on board in, in Constantine's leadership. And he said, I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. Therefore, won't you administer uh, the, the city the way it should be administered? It worked out for him. He also convened, and we just mentioned Constantine's cons uh, belief in scriptural consistency. He called together a series of the bishops from all over the empire. And he said, look, we got all these differences. We got all these gospels. Let's decide. And so they did. It took them three years. Uh, the, the Nicene Code, the one we came out of here. Uh, and the idea of the, the, uh, the Trinity was codified under Constantine. Uh, there's sort of a vague reference to the word in the Gospel of John, but no clearly articulated definition of what the Holy Spirit means. And by the way, if you ask anybody in this room how to define the Holy Spirit, I'll bet we, we come up with five different explanations. It's a, it's a hard concept to understand, but I, I, and, and I'll try to do that. But we have God, we have Jesus the Son, and then we have this spirit that sort of represents both in the world, and that's about as, as clarified as I can make it, but you can probably object to my definition too. And one, one of the reasons why, um, this is sort of a side point here, one of the reasons why Muslims find Christianity so perplexing is this whole idea of Trinity. So, it came out of this convention that Constantine uh, uh, brought about, and he, as a part of this, made Rome the Holy See. Why? Because that was the, that was the, the where, where Peter was was uh, was bishop. So Constantine was a very important part of establishing Christianity throughout the empire. Christianity was not a popular religion. <clears throat> Only about 10% of the population could be identified as Christian. Most of those were in the cities. If you're outside the city, you probably have no idea what Christianity was all about. Um, and But bishops were a, very, a big part of how the population became converted. Um, there was also some question about what, whether it was the wealthy landowner responsible for the conversion or responsible for the priest, and whether the bishop was responsible for this priest this difference between secular and spiritual control over the hierarchy persisted throughout the Middle Ages. We'll talk more about that next week. So it, it was a phenomenon. Uh, you can say to some extent it may be influential today. We don't know. Uh, let's see. What else? Yeah, so um, here's... I want to be okay time. Um, so th this is Augustine. You all familiar with St. Augustine? Okay. He, he lived just about the time of the fall of Rome. As a matter of fact, he saw the, uh, the rampaging of Rome by the Visigoths. He saw the destruction of Rome as a result of barbarian uh, incursions. And so he was, he was there at the moment. 
Uh, but he was a very important part of building up a dogma that we even that we understand today as part of the Christianity. Um, he started with the idea, Paul's idea, of Adam's disobedience of God's instruction. If you read Genesis, there's there's no, it's not really clear that Adam was disobeying God, and not really clear that his punishment was banishment from Eden, but Augustine was able to articulate that by, by saying and believing man is inherently sinful. It started with Adam. Man can't get away from being sinful. sinful. It's a part of who man is. So what, what to do with this idea of original sin? Well, um, if we are sinful, how do we decide? How do our works determine that we are salvageable? that we can be saved. Well, it's only God's decision. God decides. Not based on your good works. Not based on your faith. God decides. And this is a pretty stern uh, uh, definition. But, but, but by the way, a definition of the Presbyterian Church under, in, under uh, Henry VIII and the Tudors adopted. It was part of the Calvinistic view of predestination. Now, we we are not as harshly determinative of salvation in the Presbyterian Church today. We're a little looser about it, and that's not a, it's not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. But it is different from the idea that the Presbyterian Church originally adopted uh, under uh, under John Knox in, in uh, Scotland. So, uh, he also believed, okay, so if God decides, well, what's the role of the church? And uh, Augustine said, look, that, that there needs to be a role in the church in all this, and the church is the custodian of salvation. Mm -hmm. The church watches over to make sure that those believers are in fact worthy of salvation. And so there's something called baptism, where if you, when you're baptized, you're washed, the sin washes away. Well, you're a person. And one baptism, and the next day, you you continue to be sinful. So, well, now what? Well, there's such a thing as Eucharist, which is a sort of a, uh, um, a nourishment of the soul. And, and also, there's this whole idea of, uh, of forgiveness, where you go in, you confess your sins, uh, and they say, the priest says, you're forgiven of your sins, but you have to pay a penalty called penance. The penance might be saying a few prayers. The penance might mean giving alms to the church. It might mean something even more severe, but nonetheless, you're forgiven, but. And that forgiveness only lasts so long. And once you die, you still have sin washing over you. So the question is what happens? Well, you go to purgatory. Purgatory, by the way, is a variation on purging, where you are in purgatory in order to be purged of your sins. How are you purged from, of your sins? Through prayer, through the intervention of the church, through the intervention of saints. We'll talk more about saints uh, next week. This whole idea of the spiritual presence uh, of a saint uh, or even of a priest helps you work your way through purgatory to the point where, boom, you're saved. Complicated idea. Thank you, Augustine, for coming up with something like this and, and making it, by the way, an institutional part of the Catholic Church. It continues to be the case today. I'm not, I'm not being critical. I'm not making jokes or fun. I'm just saying this, is, this all came from St. Augustine. <clears throat> um, Okay, uh, so this is the separate, we talked a little bit about this. Um, this is the separation of the West and the East. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, there were barbarian tribes north of the Roman Empire for hundreds of years. They existed there and the Roman Empire existed here. And as long as the Mil Roman Empire was militarily strong, it was a good way to keep separate them from us. Well, over time, as I said, military is expensive, 
And what Rome began to do was to incorporate barbarian warriors into the Roman military. And by the way, the barbarians loved the idea of Rome. It was peaceful there. It was wealthy there. Why should I live in a tent in Germany when I can come into the Roman Empire and be much more comfortable? So it was an accommodation of uh, uh, barbarians. By the way, the, the term is, is not meant to be negative. It started out as a, as a true way of distinguishing one from the other. Barbarians were glad to be a part of the Roman Empire. And they felt honored to be a part of the Roman military. And over time, of course, the, 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 the military of the barbarians became incorporated into the hierarchy of the Roman, the Roman military. And suddenly, Rome had lost control of the military. And suddenly, the Goths, the Visigoths, the, Lam the, the Lam Lombards, uh, all these other uh, these tribes were in the takeover city by city one by one Roman Empire, to the point where in 450, according to uh, Gibbons, um, the Roman Empire fell. Didn't occur all of a sudden, it didn't occur in 450, but it's a convenient way of characterizing the fall of the, of the Roman Empire. Um, let's see here. Um, oh, yeah, so um, now the barbarian takeover of the Roman Empire was not like they started behaving like the Roman Empire. They did. They, it was a brutal way of life. Wealth was generated by the acquisition of land and by the acquisition of plunder, which is to say the wealth associated with the land. And in order to expand your wealth, you had to expand your geography. And this was done brutally. This was done without... Um, any care for who was hurt and who was not. So it was a very tough uh, existence. It was also not very limited. A lot of the literary uh, strength of, of Rome began to dissipate over time as the barbarians took over more Roman land. And it was less uh, centered in cities. So it was a very different cultural experience, very different political experience, having implications for how Christianity worked and the role of Christianity as the Middle Ages proceeded. Uh, one of the reasons why Europe was as settled as it was in a primarily Western Europe is because of the church. Church played a very important role in administering peace and uh, literacy in, in the uh, in the barbarian empire um th this map by the way shows a pretty neat little different division among all these these tribes it wasn't like this at all it was it's convenient to talk about this but all these tribes had certain territory they might have kinships with other territories the the uh the agreements they had from one uh, we, one ruler to another uh, worked for one generation and fell apart in the next generation. It was a pretty messy political situation. Uh, but nonetheless, the Roman Empire, as we understood it, understood it uh, during its heyday, had dissipated to the point of non-existent. Um, now, where was Christianity in all this? Well, there were bishops. There was part of the local control to the extent there was, and bishops continued to convert people to Christianity. Now, there was some advantage for a ruler to be blessed by the church. It gave them spiritual authority uh, over and above the brutality of the rule. So it was convenient for the ruler. And also, by the way, Rulers for people, and then they get about to die, and what happens then? And the message, the Christian message of salvation, of having a life after life, it's pretty appealing. Oh, really? I get life after life? Well, then all I need to do is believe in, in, in Christ and in, in Christianity? Sign me up. I think it'd be so snide, but, but it gives you an idea. This had, <clears throat> this had some power. So one way or the other, through, through uh, conversion, 
through the convenience of uh, 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 relig religious authority to, to the secular ruler. All of these things contribute to the spread of Christianity to the point where in Western Europe, it became known as Christendom. Which is to say, there was a unifying influence of, of the church had to the territory, uh, the, the literate, to the extent that uh, a ruler wanted to expand power uh, and influence over and above plunder and territorial acquisition, it was through administration, it was through taxation, it was through literacy, it was through pe finding people from the church who could do things like uh, tabulate tax rolls, make sure who paid and who didn't. So the church was very much a part of the administration, in addition to having a kind of spiritual credibility for the ruler and for and for the uh, for the, uh, the the territory. Uh, Makes sense. That's it. I was able to get this, and with five minutes to go, <laughs> uh, I will entertain questions, but no more than five minutes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, visually. Two, em two emperors, the split. There's a major split also between the Western Church and the Eastern Church, yes. Eastern Orthodox and, and uh, yeah. Catholicism. And that just seems to parallel the, the political environment. Is that fair? <clears throat> yeah, so, and thank you for that. I, I actually eliminated this slide for, for interest of time, but yes, there is the Eastern Orthodox Church. Yeah. Eastern Orthodox Church is different from the Roman Catholic Church because it was much more specifically territorial and much more specifically cultural. So uh, there is the Russian Orthodox Church, there is the Greek Orthodox Church, there is a variety of churches, each of which have their own cultural identity. And that's part of the Eastern Orthodox religion is to have local control over uh, 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 over the administration, the governance of the church. And that that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Did you have a question? Um, I was just wondering: Is in all of these pagan religions, was there any other mid all of those that? Did not allow images like Christianity does not, it's spiritual. And Judaism as well. Well, Christianity does allow uh, images. Go to the Catholic Church, yes. there's plenty of images. <laughs> <laughs> Although part, part of the Reformation is to say no images. We don't want any paintings, we don't want any sculptures. This is, we're here to be true Christians and to worship and not worry about some iconic figure. Um, so th there is that. Um, I I'm sorry, I, I didn't. The rest of your question. I just wondered whether both Judaism and Christianity were unique in that their God was the Spirit. Yes. Than, than the yes. Okay. Uh, now th there is, of course, uh, that uh, one of the Ten Commandments is not the, the "Thou shalt not worship any graven image," but that's of God, not Jesus. That. That's a, maybe a fine distinction, <laughs> but nonetheless, a fine distinction that we're all comfortable with. Where we have, where is it? Do we have any paintings of Jesus here? Mm -hmm. Usually, every church has a painting of Jesus. <laughs> uh, he, he, by the way, he looks like he was born in southern France. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, never mind. We got him in the sanctuary. There. <laughs> right. Um, so <clears throat> it, it, it depends uh, in many. Protestant religions, there is an insistence that there, act, there be nothing to represent a religious figure, as in Islam, too. Uh, no depictions of God, no depictions of Muhammad for that matter. So there's a part of the worship experience that either, either revels in representations of religious figures or eschews them as terrible and anti-religious.
How am I doing here? We're doing great. <laughs> so next week, we're going to talk about the Middle Ages, and we're going to talk about the maturation of, the, of Christianity. A lot of what we think of being Catholic didn't occur until hundreds of years have passed. So for instance, the celibacy of priests, not originally part of the Catholic Church. Uh, we'll see how all these cultural influences began to change how the practice of, of uh, Christianity and the Catholic Church. Uh, we'll also talk about the Reformation. Uh, I will tell you that the Reformation is not simply Martin Luther tagging on 95 pieces to some local church. It was, it, it, it took a long time for the Reformation to begin unfolding. We'll talk more about that. We'll also talk about how the Reformation is probably one of the most deadly political experiences you can find in human history. Lots of people die as a result of uh, they're being associated with one religion or another. Okay? So next week, we'll talk about the Middle Ages and the Reformation, and, and with any luck, we'll talk about the church in America in two weeks.